grace and peace be with you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Heritage United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Bob Michaelidis, associate pastor here, along with Reverend Amy Beth Coleman, our lead pastor, who will be bringing you the message today. And as a reminder, you may click on our website at the bottom of this Facebook post if you would like to know and see more information and how to give and the ministries that happen here at Heritage. And in the meantime, let us prepare our hearts and minds for uh, all that God has in store for us this worship service. I greet you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning to each of you on this Ascension Sunday. So glad that we could be gathered for worship together. Whether you are sitting in your pajamas in your living room, whether you are gathered at the kitchen table looking at a computer screen, wherever you are gathered, we are gathered as one people, one Lord, one faith. As we prepare now for this time of worship, take a deep breath. Breathe in deeply of God's Holy Spirit. Allow God's Spirit to fill you, to comfort you, to quiet your mind, and to still your soul. Be filled with the presence of God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. May your Spirit unite us as your people. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. May your Spirit empower us. May your Spirit transform and renew us. That during this time together we may worship you and your awesomeness. And in that worship, we will be changed. We will be renewed into the church and the people that you would have us to be. Come, Holy Spirit, come. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sisters and brothers, our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote all about Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took, them out, took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven 
will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as the scripture has been read and your word will be preached upon, may we hear with joy what you say to us today. May these words be yours and yours alone. May this message be unique to each of us. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. August 10th, 1988. Two days before my 18th birthday, I was in Cleveland, Ohio at Blossom Music Center at my first concert. Do you remember your first concert? This was mine. My older brother had bought tickets and he took me to this concert to see the rock band, wait for it, Huey Lewis in the News. I know that ages me. At that concert, I experienced and learned about an encore. You know, the practice of the concert ending but the expectation that the concert wasn't really over yet. The audience would yell and clap for a while and eagerly watch the stage and wait for the singer or the band to return and play just one more song. And that could happen even more than once, I've found out since then in other concerts. I don't remember the song that was that Huey Lewis in the News played for an encore at that concert, but I do remember the excitement and the anticipation that the concert wasn't really over. We would have at least one more song. Now, if you look up the history of encores, you will find a variety of ideas and opinions on how the concept of an encore started. But all the accounts did share some general ideas. The idea of an encore developed in the early 1700s, in the 18th century, with musical, both instrumental and voice performances. Remember that there was not any recording equipment at the time. So this was an audience's only opportunity to hear a certain song or a piece that they would like. So it wasn't unusual, apparently, for performers to be interrupted in the middle of a performance to play or sing a song one more time. Over the centuries, that practice developed into an appreciation for a performance and wanting just one more song. The expectation was that a band or a singer would save one of their songs for the encore that was surely coming. The word encore is really French and means longer, yet again. But fascinatingly, a French audience would yell bis when they wanted a repeat performance, which means again. So how did encore enter the English language? Some sources say it's likely the corruption of the Italian word ancora, which means again. That's the word that Italian audiences would yell for more at their Italian performances. However, the word encore and its practices ended up in our culture is a fascinating and varied history. But I think we can surely agree on the concept of an encore. We can appreciate the feelings of anticipation and eagerness behind it. The idea of not wanting a special event to end. The desire to delay that ending a bit. I think we all can appreciate that concept of an encore. Just like we can appreciate the feelings of the disciples 
in our scripture reading today. Think about it. They had spent three years with Jesus. He was their teacher, their mentor, their friend, and now they understood after the resurrection their Messiah, the Son of God. They had spent years with him and then witnessed the grief and disbelief and horror of his crucifixion and death. And then the joy of his resurrection. He was raised from the dead and appeared to them and ate with them and talked and walked with them for 40 days. Of course they didn't want that to end. So when he ascended, I wonder if they were waiting for an encore. I wonder if they were waiting for Jesus to appear to them alive just one more time. Can you imagine? Can you relate to the disciples wanting an encore? This is Ascension Sunday, the Sunday that we hold in our church season 40 days after the resurrection to remember Jesus' ascension to the right hand of God as in our Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Ascension Sunday pivots us from the Easter season to Pentecost. As Pastor Bob read earlier from Acts 1-9, when he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took them out, took him out of their sight. Now, as that's in Acts, as for the Gospels, they have some different accounts on the ascension. The Gospel of John doesn't have anything about an ascension. Matthew simply has the Great Commission as its ending, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark, in the edited ending, the longer ending that was added in the second century in chapter 16, verse 19, says this, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Now the Gospel of Luke which is the companion to the book of Acts, the first part of Luke's story, with Acts being the second part, includes the ascension in Luke 24, 50. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried into heaven. So scripture witness tells us that about 40 days after his resurrection appearance, Jesus ascends to the right hand of God the Father, the hand of honor and authority. But a bit before that ascension, the disciples have a question. Listen to Acts 1, verses 6 through 8 again. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, in the ends of the earth. Now, the fact that the disciples, those who had traveled with, served with, lived with, laughed with Jesus, those who could have reached out and hugged Jesus whenever they wanted, that these folks, these disciples, still have a question, gives me hope. Someone once said there's a reason why they are called disciples. 
if they still don't get what Jesus had been trying to say about the kingdom of God, that it's not a physical, geographical, geopolitical kingdom, then I reckon there's hope for me in my questions, and I reckon there's hope for us. Jesus has been talking and teaching about the kingdom of God, who is welcome in God's kingdom. Spoiler alert, all people are and how to live out the kingdom. He even taught the disciples a prayer about it, a prayer we still pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Don't the disciples remember all that? Don't we remember all that? And yet, and yet, they still ask Jesus, are you going to now restore the kingdom of Israel, as if to say, Lord, we know what you taught and we hear you and we can appreciate it, but we have this idea still of what your kingdom should look like. Lord, our ancestors have been preaching about it for centuries. We still want you to work that vision out. We still want you to physically restore our earthly kingdom according to our preferences and ideas. I believe the disciples ask a well-informed and well-intentioned question, but oh so off the mark of what God has done in Jesus what God is about to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, I can imagine that own question, Lord, is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel on our own lips today, except it would probably sound something like, yes, Lord, we have found new ways to be the church, but is now the time when we will get back to exactly how we were a year ago? All of this making disciple stuff is good, Lord, but could you make our sanctuary completely full again like it was 10 years ago? Jesus, we know you're working in new and mighty ways. We've seen it and been a part of it, but could you just restore this community of faith to a former glory? I can imagine the questions we would ask if Jesus was standing before us concerning our next ministry steps, can you imagine? Can you relate? Let me reiterate and paraphrase Jesus' response to that question. If now is the time for the kingdom to be restored, Jesus says, don't worry about that. Your job is to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, receive my resurrecting, creating spirit, and be witnesses to my life, death, and resurrection. Go ahead and tell people what I am doing in your life and be about the business of making disciples, and I will take care of the rest. I can imagine Jesus saying that to us encouraging and reminding us people of God move forward with the mighty work of the church that God is preparing for us, the kingdom work that is before us. And then after saying all that, after the disciples' question and Jesus' response, Jesus ascends. Now, I'm a former English teacher, and I can tell you that if the writer of Luke turned this in as a paper, I would have in my margin and red pen include more details here. What did the ascension look like? Use your senses to describe the scene. Was there a sound? Was there a noise? But all we get is Acts 1-9. When he said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. That's it. Likely, though, because the writer of Luke wants us to be more focused on the next section. Acts 1.10, while he was going, 
and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The disciples were stuck, watching and waiting for Jesus to return. They were stuck and staring at that stage, waiting for the encore. Friends, I have some news to share with you today. I believe that we are the encore. We are the next act. We are up. Yes, Jesus will return. Jesus will come again in the same way. We, pray, we say that in our prayer of great thanksgiving when we partake of communion, when we say, we proclaim together the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And in our Apostles' Creed we say, and he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. Jesus' return is an orthodox belief in our faith. We can count on it. But this Ascension Sunday, we are confronted with the question of, in the meantime, why do you stand looking up at the sky? And we do that, don't we? We get stuck staring at the heavens. We do that when we focus too much on expecting God to act and forgetting that God has equipped us to be witnesses. We do that when we longingly stare into the heavens and wonder if God is finally going to act the way we want. Longingly remembering days of old and want Jesus to simply restore that time. We do that when we as God's people spend too much time within the community of faith, worshiping and studying and praying and fellowshipping and not enough time in the community around us. We can gaze longingly towards the heavens for a long time and we can miss what is going on around us and the mission of who we are called to be, to be witnesses, to make disciples, we are the encore. We are the body of Christ in the world, the hands and feet of Christ in this place and this space in Lynchburg, Virginia in 2021. Rachel Held Evans shared a blog about the presence of Christ in the world. She shared it after her experience with World Vision and traveling to Bolivia. Rachel writes this. On the highest hill in Cochabamba stands the Cristo de la Concordia, the second largest statue of Jesus in the world. At 112 feet tall, this steel and concrete Christ of peace towers over the city with arms outstretched, tiny windows dotting his hollow body so the tourists inside can peer out into the world. She says, on our last day in Bolivia, we took the narrow winding road up the San Pedro Hill to see the statue. And then she says, I confess, I've always been a bit weirded out by giant renderings of Jesus. The radical rabbi from Nazareth spoke so often of humble obedience and quiet service. Pomp and grandeur don't seem like his style. And after all we had seen with world vision in Bolivia that week, this statue of Jesus, though beautiful, seemed so still and so removed from the people below, looming over a city where hunger, abuse, poverty, and despair still hide in shadowy corners. And then she says, I suddenly remembered in that moment a favorite poem from St. Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the ones with which he looks, compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. 
Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You're, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. A statue cannot be Christ in this world because a statue cannot be animated by the Holy Spirit. But people can. Friends, why do we stand looking up toward the heaven? It is time for the Encore Act, and we are it. The world, at least our little corner of it, is watching. Let's give them some grace, some mercy, some forgiveness, some love. Let's feed people and change lives. Let's give them the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Amen. Sisters and brothers, let us now join our voices and our hearts and our souls as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, we are thankful for you. We're thankful for this sanctuary. We're thankful for our homes. We're thankful for any way in which we come before you to worship you to give you thanks and praise for the things that you've done in our lives, to give you thanks for Jesus who showed us this way and this revolution that we too are to partake in. But Lord, forgive us when we are stuck. Forgive us when we get stuck looking up and saying, what's next? Give us more Forgive us when we are expecting the encore, when we are expecting Jesus to do it again and again and again. Forgive us when we forget that Jesus taught us the way so that we can be Jesus in the world, that we could be further made in your image, that we could be the children you've called us to be, that we are the answer. Lord, inspire us, renew our faith, renew our resolve that we go out into our community, that we are change agents, not that we are going to transform people, but that we are to be the image of Christ in the world, that people see us and they want transformation, they want change because they see it in us. Lord, guide our hearts this Ascension Sunday. Take our gaze from the heavens and allow us to look into our community, look outside our windows of our homes, peer outside our car windows at all that we can do. Remind us that the field of ministry is wide open and that it's anything we can see all that you've created for us. Inspire us to use our talents and our skills to be the hands and feet of Christ. When we see a lonely person by themselves, let us be their companion. When we see the hungry, let us be their food. When we see those who need guidance, let us be the light. Let us embody all that you are and allow us to be filled with this Holy Spirit that we are inspired and that we're not stuck gazing hopelessly, awaiting a return, but instead being people of action and of response to your love. And Lord, may we continue to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us long ago. Our the Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this, this day, day our daily bread. bread. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Friends, there is a time for looking up, for being reminded that God is God and we are not. But don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck in that place of gazing towards the heavens. Look around. See where God is working and get busy doing that work. Be the encore this week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.